Hello darlings, and it's um, it's like deja vu all over again. Once again, you are joining me in the guest cupboard as I attempt to turn on the computer. And today I'm determined that I'm going to do it quickly and effectively. It's not going to be a long drawn out faff like it was yesterday. This is the finger that I will be using. Here we go. Okay, this is not going entirely as I hoped. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely and utterly ridiculous. How can it be? It moves. It's never in the bloody same... Ah, there it is. This is the old live stream phone. It's an iPhone X with 256 giggle sticks of memory. And I'm sending this off to Emma uh, and hopefully that is going to solve the joint live stream problem so that Emma will once again uh, be able to do the joint live streams. So that means we need to get to the post office and I need to pack this. Right. <coughs> I'm pretty sure no harm is going to come to that now. Right. Off to the post office. Right, well, I was going to bang on a bit more about the old life story, wasn't I? So, um, we're, so in the last one, we got up to where um, uh, things on the bike came to an end. And it's a little bit blurry but I can basically remember I think so um, I'm 18 years old um, right I do need to mention didn't talk about this before academia school education all of that thing um, from an early age I was on some sort of official record as I can't remember the terminology but I was put through a, a series of tests and so on. And I was identified as being some sort of a particularly gifted academically um, child. And they wanted to do various things. They wanted me to go to a special school uh, for the academically gifted. Uh, and we decided, I can't remember if I decided or my parents decided or if it was a joint thing. To the best of my recollection, I didn't want to go because um, I wouldn't have been able to ride the bike. Uh, and at that stage, I didn't give a shiny toss that I was academically gifted made no difference to me whatsoever. Um, my parents didn't want me to go because they didn't think that I would cope emotionally with boarding school. It was a boarding school. And they didn't think that I would cope with that very well. And yeah, they were probably right. So it didn't happen. But the point was I was on some form of official record uh, as being particularly gifted and that that did come in useful at this point in my life because it enabled me to do certain things. Uh, one of which, for example, was to do my A-levels in one year rather than two, which gave me then a free year to go to Europe and um, try my luck on the continent um, with, the, with the old bicycle. So my A-levels, my I only did four. I can't remember why I didn't do more. I did English, economics, um, sociology and psychology, and obviously sociology doesn't count. So, oh hello, tractor. So in a real sense, I, I suppose I only did three. Uh, but there we are. So, <clears throat> the bike thing has come to an end and I'm back in the UK. Now, to the best of my recollection, I kind of just buggered about for a year or two. Um, I played pool to a pretty high standard. I played.
played snooker to uh, kind of uh, club standard. Uh, what else did I do? I did a degree or two, and I worked in a bar at the uh, at the local social club. Um, and yeah, just kind of buggered about doing um, doing that sort of thing, really. And then at some point, I. Uh, I got my first girlfriend. I never messed about with girls when I was um, when I was on the bike. Didn't really know what they were for, and I was probably one of the UK's oldest virgins. But um, yeah, I got I got a girlfriend, and as you tend to do with your first girlfriend, even though I was rather old to have a first girlfriend, then. Um, you know, I thought that she was the love of, love of my life. You do, don't you, with your first? And, you know, you you kind of dive in with with both feet. And, um, yeah, so that, that was it. Got my first girlfriend, lost my virginity, and, um, and that's it. That's it. You just think, right, that's it. I love this girl. And you plan to get married and all of that, all of that kind of thing, and you're, um, you're utterly obsessed with it. Oh, that's an interesting looking chap. Wasn't he an interesting looking chap? Right, back in a minute. Right, that's that done. And, oh. The M11 will have her new live stream tool before one o'clock tomorrow. Assuming dear old Royal Mail did their thing. Right, where did I get to? Uh, yeah, so I've got a girlfriend. Huh. That was um, that was a revelation in more ways than one. Anyway, Donna was working as a cook at a local hotel and. She really wanted a change. Um, I didn't really have much of a clue what um, what I was going to do with myself, and uh, an opportunity came up. It must have been advertised somewhere, maybe in one of the trade magazines that we had back then. Donna saw it, not me, and it was an advert for um, uh, an assistant management couple at a pub and Donna sort of said well look you don't know what you want to do you don't know what you're doing I want to change why don't we go for this and so we did and we uh, and we got it and the place was a big old country pub restaurant called Maddo Rourke's Kipper House Formerly the Red Lion in Bradley Green in rural Worcestershire. Now the um, the Kipper House was part of the little pub company owned by Mad O'Rourke, or real name Colin. Nice chap, actually. And it was very different to the rest of the pubs in the chain. All of the other pubs were, well, most of them were in the black country. And Colin was a big believer in chimneys, meaning success. So if you had chimneys around you, you would have a successful pub. But the Kipper House rather bucked that trend because it was um, a huge 110-seater pub restaurant, as I say, in rural Worcestershire, uh, really out in the sticks a bit, although on a reasonably busy road, but certainly nowhere near a, uh, a town or anything of, the, anything of that nature. And I guess he was planning that to be a kind of um, uh, a standout figurehead for the, uh, for the group. Um, <laughs> I imagine that he might have got it quite cheaply because um, the place had a little bit of history to it in that the, the person that had it before 
went a bit mad and he started doing some crazy things. He would, um, he would have a barrel of rotten tomatoes and he'd sit on a deck chair in the car park with a catapult <laughs> firing these rotten tomatoes at customers' cars. And it was around the time that he developed the habit of if anybody complained about the food, uh, he would disappear to the kitchen, bring back a dead cat, and I apologise for, for that, slap that on the table and try that instead. Well, it was um, at around that time that the pub was closed down by the old um, health and safety people. And Colin took it over. It became Maddo Rook's Kipper House. And because there was a lot of work to do to, you know, get things back on track, and because it was a sizable pub restaurant, it was decided that one management couple wasn't enough. Um, now, the management couple that were in there were a lovely couple called Les and Jan. He was Welsh, she wasn't. And they had a lifetime of experience in the pub trade. They knew, um, they knew exactly what they were doing. And myself and Donna became the assistant management couple. And um, gosh, yeah. And for an interesting period, we lived in a static caravan on the on the car park, huge car park, massive. And we had no running water, no electricity. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, it was fun times and it was an interesting pub. Um, the clientele, we were lucky, the young farmers, the local young, young farmers adopted the pub as their pub. So that was it, you know, when you've got the, oh, for God's sake. When, um, when you've got the young farmers on side, then you can't really fail. Um, but yeah, it, it, it was interesting because Colm had some weird ideas. Um, he was kind of a genius in his way, I think. One of the more disconcerting ideas was sawdust. His argument was that when he was a kid, in Ireland, you went to the pub because the pub had carpets and in your house at home, you had sawdust on the floor. Well, his argument now was everybody's got carpets in the house. So when they go to the pub, they're going to want sawdust on the floor. So we had no carpets. We had bare floors and sawdust. Now, unfortunately, the sawdust was not the fire retardant type. So you were always living in some danger of the whole thing going up in smoke and you'd have no insurance, but uh, Colm didn't worry about that sort of thing. Um, one of the other interesting things was that he refused to serve chips in the restaurant. We were the only, which now I thoroughly approve of, so we were the only restaurant around where you couldn't get chips with your whatever. Um, not sure of the meaning behind that, um, but there you go, there, there were no chips. Uh, the Little Pub Company, pubs were, of course, famous for the desperate Dan Cow Pie. <laughs> uh, so we settled in there and um, I was front of house and Donna was running the kitchen. Uh, and, yeah, I, I recall it being, um, I don't recall it all that clearly, but I remember it being hard work but good fun and I remember that I... I enjoyed the trade very much. Les and Jan were very good. They taught me a lot. Um, I had something of a flair for um, uh, for the whole thing. I um, I enjoyed interacting with the customers, and I learned um, I learned from Les how to run a proper pub, and most importantly, I learned how to be a good cellarman. Uh, now, we kept, beer, we kept beers in the wood, uh, in the Kipper House. Um, so I had to learn all about the art of keeping beer in the wood and the art of really good cellar work, mounting, tapping, venting, etc., etc., etc. Now, the famous beer in the Little Pub Company, uh, Little Pub Company was Lump Hammer Bitter. And it was our own bitter with a unique taste and um, and a secret recipe for the unique taste 
Well, I can tell you what the secret recipe was. We poured all of the slops, no matter what they were, lager, mild, no matter what it was, all of the slops went into the lump hammer bitter. And that's what gave it the unique taste. But yeah, so there you go. That was, that was my entry into, into that world. And um, yeah, I don't have specific memories, to be honest. Um, but I remember it being a, a fun time, a good time, and I enjoyed, yeah, I enjoyed being in, in the industry. And of course, you know, still in the throes of my first ever relationship. And um, yeah, good times. And I'm racking my brains trying to remember how that came to an end. I was going to say that I was poached from there to do something to go on to the next thing, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But I don't think I was, in fairness. I have a vague recollection of there being a fallout. Um, now, I don't know if that was a, a fallout between myself and Donna or a fallout between myself and Colm. Uh, I don't remember falling out with Les and Jan, but I remember there was some some sort of a, a fallout and I think I left without having anything else to go to, I think. Or maybe I'd already been approached about taking on this next thing. I honestly can't remember, um, but I left. And I can't remember if Donna stayed on or not. But anyway, we'll move on in a moment. I'm going to get some lunch and then I'll tell you about what happened next. Back in a minute. I'm starting to properly remember how things went now. Donna had a falling out with somebody at the Kipper House and she was either sacked or she quit. Can't remember which. And I remember now being in a, a phone box because this was in the days before mobile phones um, having a, not an argument but a, a discussment with uh, Sheena Colum's wife because we'd been taken on as a couple and I didn't want to leave I remember being happy there at the time anyway uh, and but no because Donna had gone, either jumped or been pushed, um, I was gone as well and there was no way around it. But yeah, I remember being um, annoyed and upset in equal measures by that. And I can remember what car I was driving when I went to the phone box to make that phone call. A Citroen CX 2 litre Athena, in silver, naturally. And we both ended up working at a pub that wasn't a million miles away in Astwood Bank, uh, the Red Lion. And I can't remember if we both went there at the same time um, or if one of us went first and then the other went when something became available. But same deal, Donna was working in the kitchen uh, and I was working behind the bar. Now, I'm pretty sure that I was just working there purely as a barman. Uh, I don't even think I was a like, bar manager or assistant manager or anything. I think I was just a bug basic barman. But the, um, the Red Lion was, it was like a 90 seater pub restaurant. Uh, and it was privately owned and it was, um, and they had three other pubs in a small chain, all local. And from memory, it wasn't very long at all before I was asked if I would take over running one of the other pubs. And the pub they wanted me to take over was just a mile or two down the road in a place called Hunt End. Uh, again, this is in Worcestershire, just outside the town of Redditch, which is where my parents lived and where I was mostly brought up. And this little pub, the Little Red Line at Hunt End, it was, um, uh, it was a very old pub and it was by no means modern. And they didn't serve food. They didn't really have a 
kitchen. They certainly did not, didn't have a restaurant. It was a small-ish local pub. And I was offered this chance and they offered me uh, a deal whereby I would be paid in the normal way to run the pub. But we ran all the figures and um, they said that I could have carte blanche do what I want and if I increase business then we'll do a profit share on the increased business. So I accepted and that's what we did. Donna stayed working at the kitchen in the Red Lion Astra Bank. I went down and took over the Red Lion at Hunt End. Uh, I loved the locals. It was a very basic, very old school pub, but it was in on the edge of a really quite affluent area. And I came up with a variety of ideas to increase business. Um, the pub, if I recall correctly, the pub was like two basic areas. And I started using the second, uh, like the secondary area for functions and, um, and various things. I vividly remember putting a karaoke in there in the days before karaoke became a, a general thing. I had lots of ideas um, to try and increase the clientele from just the local old farts. Uh, I tried to pull in the uh, people from the wealthier area, areas. I tried to pull in younger people with uh, a variety of these functions. And I set up um, a rudimentary kitchen and started offering very basic pub food. Um, so not sit down meals or anything like that, but pub snacks, I suppose you would term it. And all of this worked and worked quite well. And um, I increased business markedly and um, they were true to their word and I got paid really quite well. And then at some point, I honestly can't remember the time scale, but it certainly wasn't long. I was asked if I would go back up the road to the uh, to the red line at Astwood Bank, but this time as um, as the boss, as the as the manager. And um, yeah, I accepted this, um, and so we were we were kind of back to where we were before. Um, Except this time, instead of being the assistant manager couple, we were, we were the management couple. Donna was running the kitchen, I was running everything else. And it was a really interesting time to be running a pub restaurant. It was the days of the £1.99 steak meal. And uh, I thrived on this, I, I loved it. There, was, there were a few people, um, a few pubs, and it was kind of a, a price war. And I remember our main competition was the Wheelbarrow and Castle. And um, it was all about putting together three course meals or putting a headline out there, you know, steak meal, £1.99, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and I remember that the Wheelbarrow and Castle had a distinct advantage over us. They had a cold storage facility, a separate building. Um, and they were able to buy in bulk and they were really able to hammer down on their prices when they did that. Uh, and um, it got a bit silly. You would have professional com complainers. So you'd have somebody booking your best table or your most noticeable table. They would be from one of the opposition and they would very loudly complain about the food. They would say the steak is tough or something like that. You know, there were some really underhand, dirty tricks. Uh, and everybody was just competing on price and on nothing else. And it was becoming like a bloody conveyor belt. You were, you know, customers were coming in, you were getting them served as quickly as you could, and then you needed them out um, because you needed that turnover. You needed to turn over that table seven, eight times a, a night. It got balmy. And they reached a point where I said, okay, this is mad enough. I'm not competing with this anymore. So I did a number of things. Um, I wasn't gonna comp compete on price. 
so I had to compete in other ways. First thing I did was I put all of the prices up, not just back to where they were before the price war downward spiral started, I went even higher than that. Sounds mad, but I thought I knew what I was doing. The next thing I did was I put uh, sittings into place. So instead of being at, instead of booking the table at any time and squeezing as many customers in as we could, the entire restaurant had two sittings. I can't remember what the times were, but they were like something like, for the sake of argument, say 6.15 and 8.30, if you like. And if you booked the table at 6.15 or 6 o'clock, whatever it was, then you had the table until 8.30. If you booked the table at 8.30, you had the table for the night. Now, that meant the service became a lot less frenzied, a lot less hectic. Uh, so, two other things that I wanted to do. Um, one was that now that we had more time, um, it was less rushed, I really pushed the starters and in particular the desserts. Um, and I, um, because the margins were higher on that. And I also pushed the drinks, I put in a, a new wine list. And because we had the customers sitting there longer, I would really push the drinks because um, the wet profits were always higher than the dry. And the other thing I did was I did a complete retrain on all of the waiting staff. Uh, I gave them new uniforms and I impressed on them that we were going to offer a much higher level of service. Uh, I wanted to offer the level of service that you would get in a much more expensive restaurant than ours. I also dressed the restaurant differently, dressed the tables differently, etc, etc, etc. So, we're no longer competing on price, but you get a very difficult, uh, different dining experience. It's unrushed, it's unhurried, you're getting amazing service. The staff all look superb, the restaurant looks superb. Um, and it totally, totally worked. Absolutely worked. Um, we did less covers, but each, each diner became a lot more profitable for us. And profits just went up. It was, um, yeah, it was a complete success, really. And, um, yeah, one of my... Uh, definitely one of my better ideas and it was around that time that I became um, one of or possibly the youngest publicans in the in the UK I was I think I was 21 years old when the the old name went above the door and uh, I remember I don't remember that as being a particular thing I wasn't didn't give a tinker's tit about it to be honest I just remember being interviewed for um, for a, a newspaper um, and I remember the headline was something like meet the UK's youngest publican or something like that and I remember that it was a really lousy photograph I had my eyes half shut bloody get over Mr Van they only took one photo Number one rule of photography, I'm not a photographer, but somebody told me this and it's true. When you need a photograph, never take one, take a hundred. If you take a hundred, one of them will be really, really good. If you take one, you've got a one in a hundred chance that it'll be really, really good. I never forgot that. And so, what happened then was I then got involved with the other pubs in the chain, which were the shoulder of mutton in Bromsgrove and the hare and hounds out in Shenston heading towards Kidderminster and that just kind of puddled on for a while um, yeah and it was good my memories of it were that it was bloody hard work uh, and in those days um, pubs weren't open all day 
um, you weren't allowed to open all day. And you, oh God, yeah, I remember it was really difficult because you have, um, first thing in the morning, your first job in the morning is to get down into the cellar and do all of your cellar work. And then the pub would open at whatever it was, 11 o'clock from memory. Um, you need to be all set up for that. You've got your lunchtime service. I used to, um, lunch times, I used to, God, I'm remembering stuff now. I used to concentrate on um, old age pensioners. Um, I put on specials, not in a demeaning way. Um, or at least I hope it wasn't in a demeaning way. Um, obviously, I've always had a connection with the elderly because my my mother ran an old people's home. I always uh, I always helped out with that. It's been a lifelong passion, um, still is to this day. And so, yeah, I um, I put on lunchtime. OAP specials. I didn't call them that because, you know, that would be a demeaning title in, in my mind. But you know what I'm getting at. That's the kind of thing I did. So, yeah, lunch times were not exclusively, but largely around um, uh, local elderly folk. And I loved that. I loved hanging out with them. Um, always have done, always will do. That was great. I've forgotten about that. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, I loved that. But then you've had your early start in the cellar. You've got your blah, blah, blah. Uh, you've got your lunchtime service. Then the pub will close at half two. And you've then got whatever it was, two and a half or three hours before you open again. Uh, and that's kind of not long enough to do anything, really. Um, <clears throat> you end up just... Um, You end up just oh, hanging out with other people in the pub. I can't remember what we used to do in the afternoons. Probably quite a bit of shagging. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and then you open again for the evening. And um, we had um, we had quite a thriving bar. It, we didn't go completely restaurant. We had... Uh, a small but perfectly formed bar for the for the locals and we did a decent business in the bar as well and it was a proper local pub I did lock-ins every night with the locals um, God uh, one day I'll tell you some of the stories especially the ones about Big Ted there was um, there was a I can't remember the name of the fun fair but one of the really well-known names uh, was it Wilson Wilson Funfairs they almost directly opposite they had like um, uh, a massive big bungalow where one of the family or some of the family lived and a big old storage facility for the fairground rides and some of the lads um, used to um, uh, used to come into the into the pub into the bar side I particularly remember Ted fearsome looking bloke his chest and back were crisscrossed with um, with knife cuts from various fights and whatnot. Long hair chap, he, he couldn't read or write. Massive fellow, terrifying. I'd hate to go into a fight with him. Nicest guy you'd ever meet in the world. Don't get on the wrong side of him, but nicest guy you'd ever meet in the world. So, yeah, I, I would do lock-ins every night, so it turned into a bloody late night. And, yeah, I remember it being quite a hard life. Staggering up to bed at whatever time in the morning, two or three o'clock. And then, you know, getting up in the morning, down into the cellar, and doing that seven days a week. Um, but, yeah, I remember it on the whole as being um, hard work, but I was young and fit. And I just remember it being good fun and bloody enjoyable. And I was earning a few bob. And now we come to a big old gap in my memory log. Um, as I say, it carried on for a while, um, being involved with all of, the, um, all of the houses in the chain. I can't remember 
how, why or when it came to an end. Uh, I've got a feeling that Donna and I were splitting up something like that and it um, maybe it all got a bit messy or something. I honestly, I honestly cannot remember. Um, no, I can't, I can't remember. I can't even remember if it was, whoop, hello. Breathe in, you're welcome. I think it was based around uh, split up with Donna, something something of that nature. Can't remember any of the details. If I remember before uh, it's time to say good night, I will come back to this and fill you in. So I'm gonna have to jump ahead to what is the final chapter in my pub and restaurant story. As I say, can't remember how I came to leave the uh, that chain. I just remember that the next step was, and I can't remember how I got there, but somebody that I knew from that chain, uh, he and his wife were very regular customers, um, both bar and restaurant. And I remember them being amongst my favorite people. I'm pretty sure his name was Chris and he was a milkman and he had been um, saving his pennies very hard and <clears throat> he decided that he wanted to stop being a milkman and he wanted a pub or they wanted a pub as a husband and wife team um, and he'd bought this pub and he asked me, would I be willing to um, effectively to train him in how to run a pub? So would I be willing to go and run the pub for him and also with him? I don't think that offer was the reason that I left the chain. I don't think it was, but maybe it was um, like a perfect storm of things. Maybe I was splitting up with Donna, that came up. I Maybe I just wanted to change, I honestly can't remember. But that was the opportunity, and the pub that he was taking over was the Hollybush on Old Gorkut Hill. Um, the <clears throat> Gorkut Hill had been replaced by a dual carriageway that ran from Redditch to the Maypole, and um, the pub was on the old Gorkut Hill, which was now a dead end. So I agreed to this, and I went to that pub, and um, with on the understanding that, as I say, I was going to run it, I was going to show him how to run it, and went in there, made an assessment. The staff were fairly long-term staff. And I quickly came to the realisation that um, at best they were set in their ways and lazy and at worst they were on the fiddle. I don't think the last gaffer had been the most on the ball chap in the world. So I sacked everybody. I sacked every single member of staff. Uh, the ones who'd been on the fiddle, or I considered were just not worthwhile, they stayed sacked. The others, I invited them to reapply for their jobs, but with a new job description. I told them, you know, what I would expect of them, the way things were going to be, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, that worked. That worked. And I've just had another memory. Before we get to the very end of this story, and we are close, I remember a Canadian chef working there, <clears throat> a gay Canadian chef. And it was the first time that I'd kind of spent a lot of time hanging out with a gay bloke, you know? I was of a generation where you made fun of gay people, um, or it was an insult or whatever. And I discovered that I really, really liked this guy. I really liked him, not in a gay way, obviously, but I just really liked him. Um, and um, he used to tease.
teased me terribly. He used to flirt with me outrageously. He genuinely did fancy me. Uh, and I just really liked him. Um, and he was a bloody good chef and a great guy. And we worked fantastically together. And the thing that I've just remembered, people ask me where my foodie thing came from, my love of food. And I've always said it was down to the two fat ladies. Um, or, um, or um, what's his name, Keith Floyd. But it wasn't, it was down to this Canadian chef. I can't remember his name. It could have been Daniel. But then I've got a chef, Daniel, who's a brilliant supporter of this channel. Um, and I might be getting it mixed up, but the name Daniel does ring a bell. And it was he who gave me my love of food. And I apologize to him because I've never, I've never attributed uh, that to him. He taught me more about food than I'd known before because he was, um, with all due respect to Donna and uh, everybody else working in the kitchen, he was a cut above. He was a proper chef. All of the people I'd worked with before were cooks and we were making, you know, standard pub restaurant fare, you know, steaks or you know, all of that sort of thing. Whereas, we'll call him Daniel. If I remember his name, I'll update this. Whereas he was a chef, chef, a proper trained chef. And, you know, there was, everything was bespoke, made uh, made from scratch. And the thing that really stands out in my memory was a peppercorn sauce. Um, I don't do dairy. And he made me a non-dairy peppercorn sauce from scratch. I watched him doing it. And it was the nicest thing that I have ever, ever tasted. And that was it. That was the point where I became a proper foodie. And isn't that amazing? In, after 33 years, 32 years, 31 years, over 30 years anyway, that is the first time that I've remembered that. I'm so glad I do these things because I remember so much stuff that, that I, I wish I hadn't forgotten. So there we are, bless him. He was amazing. And I will bring this story to the end and I will tell you how it ended. Um, I pretty much got Chris sorted. Uh, the, new, the staff were in place, everything was up and running. It was a very successful, thriving business. And I was still there managing it. Um, but who knew how much longer that was going to go on. Chris and his wife were the publicans. I was still there managing it. Didn't know what I was going to do next until one night in that pub. And it was um, a bit of a late lock-in. And there were three blokes in there. And I'm behind the bar. And I'm listening to them talking. And they're talking about classic cars. And they clearly knew quite a bit about classic cars. And they're discussing a new enterprise that they were just about to embark on. And they're talking about certain cars. And they clearly knew a fair bit. But they didn't know as much as me. And I remember vividly that they were arguing about the differences between a Series 1 and a Series 2 Jensen Interceptor. And they were making some mistakes. So I put them right. And they kind of looked at me with different eyes from just being the bloke behind the bar giving them drinks. And they said, um, and of course I was still very young then. I was, I don't know, I was probably 23 at this point, something like that. So you wouldn't expect a 23 year old to have in-depth knowledge on classic cars. And they said, how do you know about classic cars? And um, I said that, you know, that uh, I was brought up with them, uh, that Bristol Bryan was my dad's best friend. They knew of Bristol Bryan, obviously. He was relatively local. Anybody remotely connected with classic cars knew about Bristol Bryan. And the night went on and I was drinking with them and chatting with 
after, I mean I say the night went on, this is a lock-in, we're into early morning by this stage, and at the end of the night, when they were about to set off, uh, they said they'd been talking a little bit about the new business, and they kind of said to me, um, why don't you come up to the, to the site and see us? and have a proper talk. Maybe you should be involved with this. And I'm gonna leave the story there, my lovelies. I'm going to leave the story there because from there, we're going to move on to the next chapter. And that will be for another day, but it won't be far away. So, hope you in. Uh, I hope you enjoyed some, if not all, of that little trek down memory lane. I'm genuinely delighted to have remembered things that I'm ashamed to have forgotten. So there we are. That's that. I'm at work, and um, I will see you after work for the drive home. Okay, catch you in a bit. I genuinely, honestly, feel like I've been run over by a bus or something. That was insane. Wednesday night, shouldn't be completely dead. We don't expect to be busy. Not, uh, not like tonight. Restaurant, absolutely full to capacity. As in, turning people away, full to capacity. Two big parties in, one uh, work due. The other one, 21st birthday. I'm knackered. <laughs> I'm not used to uh, I'm not used to hard work anymore, am I? Dear me. Oh. oh well, I'll sleep tonight. And I'll probably ache a bit tomorrow. We were just, um, you know, it was just non-stop off our feet. Busy. Um, and uh, the guys, uh, they're not allowed to have a break in work time. Well, sod that. Tonight, as soon as we got the, um, uh, as soon as we got the, the last main courses out, um, I said to them, go out, have five or ten minutes, do whatever you want. Sit down, smoke, whatever you want to do, have a, have a break. And when you guys have been, I'll come. Oh, we are not allowed. I said, you're allowed. You're allowed. Get out there, have a break. Oh. Right, well, I'm going to relax with some Radio Ford and the world tonight, and I will catch up with you wonderful people to say goodnight. I'm wondering how many people, if any, actually watch these things right to the bitter end, especially the longer ones, and I don't know how long this is going to be, but I suspect it's going to be one of the longer ones. So, here's a little experiment stroke challenge. If you are still watching the video at this point, I would like you please to comment, I saw Bernard's bum cheeks, with an exclamation mark if you like, and why not add the timestamp? Those are optional. But if you're watching now, type in the comments, I saw Bernard's bum cheeks. It'll be interesting to see how many people actually do watch until the end, if anyone. And I like the idea of people looking at the comments saying, hey, what? Hey, where did you see Bernard's bum cheeks? Especially if more than one person says it. That would amuse me greatly, so please do that. And here we are. We've arrived home. Thank you for your company today, as always. Wouldn't be the same without you. I hope you found some of it vaguely interesting and there will be the next chapter of my boring
boring life story coming along very soon indeed. So, let me wish you all a safe and peaceful night and a joyful day ahead. Take really good care of yourselves. Okay, darlings, much love from me and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Oh, and I've got the good wine tonight, haven't I? I've bloody earned it too. Good night, darlings.